And welcome to the latest of our CSF podcast, focusing specifically on psoriatic arthritis. We'll be bringing you new episodes on a bi-monthly basis, as well as our Axe Fa podcast. And we'll also be supplying you with monthly slide decks to help keep you up to date with the latest research and publications in the field of PSA. I am Professor Philip Meese, Director of Rheumatology Research at Swedish Medical Center, Providence St. Joseph Health, and clinical professor at the University of Washington School of Medicine in Seattle. Joining me today is Frank Behrens, medical director at Goethe University, Germany. Hello, Frank. Hi, Philip. Thank you very much for these introductions. So, yeah, we have selected two manuscripts, two papers. So, um, with addressing novel therapies, addressing inflammation, addressing combinational therapy, um, and and I'm I'm really happy that we have these two uh, manuscripts where we can discuss. So first of our paper discuss the latest trial of a novel scoring system for inflammation and tissue damage, and the second paper uh, compares uh, the additional therapy of anti-inflammatory drugs and painkillers and on steroids in patients treated with different I17A inhibitors. So Philip, first to you. Thanks, Frank. In our first paper titled Implementation of the OMERAC Psoriatic Arthritis Magnetic Resonance Imaging Scoring System in a Randomized Phase 2b Study of Abatacept in Psoriatic Arthritis by Mikkel Ostergaard and others. This was the study that was actually published originally in its clinical data in 2011. And one of the novel things that was done in this study was to obtain MRI of each of the patients in the study. A total of 123 patients uh, had MRI scans done. And what was done was to choose the most active joint uh, in either their hand or their the patient's foot. And then that particular hand or foot uh, was uh, subjected to MRI scanning at baseline and then throughout the course of the study to look in parallel with what happened on MRI as compared uh, to the uh, uh, clinical data. And what we're seeing now is a paper in which there was an extensive validation exercise uh, conducted by several different experts uh, in uh, MRI and in rheumatology uh, to utilize this data for validation of the scoring system known as the SAMRIS. This was developed by Mikkel Ostergaard uh, in relationship to the RAMRIS or the rheumatoid arthritis MRI score. And the addition in this particular scoring system is inclusion of the feet uh, as well as the hand. And this scoring system has shown reliability and responsiveness in either the hand or the foot in a pilot study. And the purpose of this particular paper is to show sensitivity to change with an agent that's known to uh, impact clinical outcomes in psoriatic arthritis. As mentioned, 123 patients were included and on day 169, patients receiving either a Batacet 10, 10 milligrams per kilogram IV, or with an induction dose of 30 milligrams per kilogram, followed by 10 milligrams per kilogram IV on a monthly basis, showed significant MRI reduction uh, in synovitis and tenosynovitis, as well as osteitis uh, uh, in uh, these treated patients as compared to placebo. Uh, and so what the study showed was that there was a, a good clinical correlation uh, between improvement uh, in the MRI scoring system, thus validating it uh, as being sensitive to change uh, in parallel or in, in correlation uh, with changes in the patient's clinical scores. So what we've learned is not only that Abatacept works, both at a clinical level, but also with objective evidence of MRI score changes 
but also uh, a validation of this uh, valuable scoring system. And I think that one of the things that this leads to in the future is increasing use of MRI, including the SAMRIS uh, score uh, in phase two PSA trials in particular for proof of concept uh, to show not only that the patients are subjectively improving with their clinical evaluations, their swollen joint counts and so forth, but also with this ob very objective marker. Yeah, I, I think this is a very interesting paper, um, but, but my first question is, about ASEPT, I think it's not so widely used in daily practice for treating PSA um, and, and why by using about ASEPT. And my second question is what we learned, if I'm correct, from the past that about ASEPT works best in, yeah, let's say to be provocative if the patient cohort looks more like an RA, polyarticular, CRP high, erosive disease. I think this was what came out from the phase three trial of Abata said, so do you believe that the MRI reflects more the typical arthritic domain? Of course, it is included not only the synovitis, but what's your opinion on it? Well, I think the key point of bringing up this article, Frank, is not so much to try to compare abatacept with other drugs. And you're absolutely right. It's, it is not top of line uh, for use in most treatment recommendations. Typically, we would use TNF inhibitors, IL-17 inhibitors, and so forth, more so than abatacept, given efficacy not only um, in joints and enthesia, but the, the efficacy in the skin was not so good. I think more importantly, though, in this particular paper is the point that regardless of the drug, we're seeing uh, performance characteristics of a method of a measurement tool that um, uh, helps validate it uh, and shows that it, uh, even with a drug that maybe is not as robust as some of the drugs we're using, uh, that we have a good correlation with clinical scores. So I think that's the key point to take mm. home here. Mm. And my, my question is, well, when we look for all these imaging techniques, would you believe that in the future, all the trials will design for a primary endpoint using this proxy for disease activity like MRI? Oh boy, I think it's, well, I, I can't speak for the EMA, but I can certainly say for the FDA, the answer is no. Yeah. Um, they are very conservative, very strict. They're also very interested in what is it that the clinicians in the United States are using for clinical assessment. And so they're for a long time uh, in the future, I think they're going to be sticking with uh, clinical scores, even as imprecise as they may be, and even using X-ray rather than MRI or ultrasound to uh, document whether or not structural damage inhibition uh, is occurring or not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it's that's the same in Europe. So it, they always want to to stick on what is already established. Don't have to be too many variables. So the only variables they accept the variable is the new drug, and all the other things should be fixed like it is and like it was in the last let's say twenty years. I think mm -hmm. it's the same with the EMA. Um, and and a, a primary endpoint of an MRI will never be accepted because also the AMA, but also in Germany specifically, where I'm familiar with in detail, is that this must be a patient relevant endpoint and an MRI change is not patient relevant. Um, it could be, uh, but it, it's not necessarily the case. So yeah, but, but I think specifically for proof of concept, I think we need short period study with a very objective endpoint where we have an idea whether this product might go into product clinic, clinical evaluation. Yeah. Now I think on to, to our yeah. next paper, Frank. Yeah, Please. so uh, we go to the second paper titled Real World, and then we are far away from proof of concept. Now we are in the real world treatment pattern and use of adjunct pain and anti-inflammatory medication among patients with psoriatic arthritis treated with IS-17A inhibitors in the United States. So authored by Pizzicato et al. I think the name looks very Italian uh, um, and more European, uh, but uh, it's a US 
analysis of uh, Medicare data set of routine use of IL-17. So uh, coming to the background, so of course you all know treatment for PSA um, can be made with different so-called DMARDs, disease-modifying antirhythmic drugs. Um, and of course, uh, modern treatment approach are the biologics or the JAK inhibitors. Um, and the choice of the individual DMARD depends on the severity of the disease, on the previous therapies and the treatment history, um, on, the, on the structural changes, um, and also on the presence of the different domains of substratic disease, for example, severe skin psoriasis, um, which might influence the decision. So of course, um, although PSA treatment guidelines include strategies for switching between different DMARTs, specifically BDMARTs, they provide little guidance around additional pain and anti-inflammatory medication use, whether it is influenced differently by different uh, products used as a DMART. So uh, much of the existing literature examining treatment patterns and educant pain and anti-inflammatory medication use among patients with PSA uh, predates the approval and uptake of IL-17A inhibitors. So maybe you are familiar with that we believe that some of the IL-17 mode of action might have positive impact on other symptoms than inflammation itself. So my psychiatrist comes always to me and said, I believe that 25% of depression is driven by inflammation. Um, and we believe that I-17 is a critical critical pathway on it. And, and um, there are uh, patients treated with high-dose steroids on depressive right now with a hypothesis that this is driven by inflammation, uh, but also uh, different other psoriatic conditions, and some of them can be cured with, uh, with steroids. That's a very interesting field. And therefore, it's clear that we, uh, the first step would be to see whether the use of this new mode of action might have an impact um, on the additional use of non-steroidals, other anti-inflammatory drugs. So this is the purpose. And in this study, uh, they compare um, these additional use of other DMARTs, non-steroidals, painkillers, steroids, in addition to newly initiated ixekizumab IL-17A inhibition or secukizumab IL-17A inhibition. You all know, uh, maybe you're familiar, these molecules are different, the affinity to IL-17 differs, um, all these things. And the question is, can this be reflected by routine treatment data when using either secu or ixe as an IL-17 inhibitor? So in total, 407 patients were identified in the ixekizumab cohort. The mean age were roughly about 50, half of them were female, and 1,500 patients were identified for secukinumab. Of course, the difference is reflecting the time when the different drugs came on the market and were approved. Um, they were slightly younger than secu patients, uh, but no uh, statistically significant differences, and it was up to 60% female patients. So um, they, of course, had uh, most of them had a psoriasis uh, disease, as a, as a coding do, uh, a diagnosis, but also arthritis. So up 60 with psoriasis versus SECU uh, and 45 standardized differences of 0.3. So the speciality of the index prescriber and mean number of prior advanced therapies were different between cohorts. This is why it is later on um, uh, normalized and, um, and analyzed in a way to to uh, get rid of these differences and, it, and uh, uh, adjunct it to the differences on, on baseline. So cohorts were balanced after waiting, and then they, you can compare it. So majority of secukinumab patients received an index dose of 300 milligram, not of the 150. Um, the persistence rate described in the manuscript for ICSA for one year was 40% and secu 43. Um, and we have um, 25 to 20 switcher to another mode of action. Um, and this is not statistically significant. Maybe you, your first reaction, at least my was, it's a little bit disappointed to see that it's only 40 um, who stick for a year. But of course you have to take into account that most of them were pre-treated uh, with another DMAR. Most of them had already uh, seen a, a TNF inhibitor. But um, when you look in detail to the numbers, you also see that we have 
another 20% addition to the 40 who stopped and reintroduced the index therapy means maybe they say stopped it due to an infection or a surgery or something like that and started again means that they were out of the interval and then defined per definition as a switcher and then they switch to the same drug to the index drug thereafter and um, so then of course it, it fits more to my experience to see that it's up to 60 percent on both drugs who stick on the treatment for at least one one year and i say in, in a routine care data i think the argument why someone is sticking on the drug is both efficacy and tolerability and safety so but there's no differences and there's also no difference in the additional use of painkillers and other anti-inflammatory drugs. Um, it was absolutely the same means. If you use this IL-17 inhibitor, either ixekizumab or thecukinumab, 60% um, will stay more or less with a, maybe a short interruption in 20% for one year on the product at least. This was the observation period. Um, and 60, roughly 60% had additional therapies. I think that's not surprising to me, to be honest, because some of them stick on the previous use of methotrexate and add it. Others, of course, had painkillers um, or non-steroidals uh, in case there is some pain. Um, interestingly, some have still steroids. I think this is what we want to get rid of. Um, but there's no difference between these two different molecules targeting IL-17A. So in conclusion, Ixekizu and Secokinumab patients had similar treatment patterns and use of adjunctive pain and anti-inflammatory medication after adjusting for baseline differences. Further research is needed to examine the reason for discontinuation. Um, and again, mostly is secondary or primary loss of response or intolerance and the use of additional therapies and to compare treatment pattern um, so as to better inform treatment decision in PSA. And of course, I would add, would also be nice to see a product with a different mode of action um, coming back to the introduction about anti-inflammatory effect of IL-17 beyond musculoskeletal and skin complaints. Yeah, this would be nice, but overall interesting analysis of the additional use of drugs, independent whether you use ICSA or secukinumab. Yeah, Philip, what's your comment on it? So there's several thing, uh, things that you brought up, Frank, that I think are important. And one of them is the whole issue of whether or not some of the drugs we use are treating symptoms such as pain or fatigue by reduction of inflammation alone or by some direct effect potentially on the central nervous system by mediating various changes uh, in the a phenomenon of peripheral and central sensitization. Uh, this was first brought up when we were looking at the rapidity of pain relief with JAK inhibitors and work that we've done uh, with the JAK inhibitor tofacitinib using a method uh, uh, called mediation analysis or path analysis showed that the majority of effect of the JAK, that JAK inhibitor was a direct effect on pain as opposed to waiting for the reduction of inflammation as reflected in CRP or swollen joint count. And so um, this has also been looked at with ixekizumab, one of the IL-17 inhibitors in their axial uh, uh, spa studies in which it was a similar phenomenon was shown. And that is that there is some effect, of course, uh, on pain relief through reduction of inflammation, but it appears that some of this effect may be more direct. And we know that these large molecules uh, like uh, biologics don't Across the blood-brain barrier theoretically. So there must be perhaps some peripheral or uh, dorsal horn phenomena uh, going on that's, that's affecting uh, neurobiology of pain and fatigue. I also uh, am thinking about an a abstract that was presented at the ACR meeting from a French cohort on the whole subject of switching and cycling. Uh, in which they looked at almost 3,000 patients in a French registry and showed, unfortunately, that uh, the persistence rate at one year was only about 42% um, in, a, in a group of patients that were uh, had previously been on the TNF inhibitor and now were switching second line to either 
a TNF inhibitor or an IL-17 inhibitor or an IL-1223 inhibitor. And the overall population showed this uh, unfortunate uh, 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 kind of low rate of persistence, but the um, uh, it looked like there was a better uh, outcome if the patient switched to a different mechanism, either an IL-17 or an IL-1223 inhibitor than staying with a TNF inhibitor. So that means that it's really good that we are having different mechanisms of action being developed and approved for patients with with this disease psoriatic arthritis so i'm 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 happy that we are having more and more options to choose from because of this situation we find ourselves in frequently of having to decide do we stick with a drug that is, seems to be ebbing in its effectiveness or do or do we switch i'm i i remember when we had this discussion with the PDE4 and depression in psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis patient, um, that uh, all of us who are working in clinical trials got this huge assessment of suicidal ideation from all the different products independent of the mode of action. And I remember a very interesting analysis of the IL-17 and IL-23 where you see that depressive, or at least with the EQ5D, which is not to be honest, a, a depression inventory, but nevertheless, mood, a depressive mood and anxiety is included, and this drops down dramatically. And of course, we can discuss whether it's only in those who respond, and it's a reactive to the good response, but the same with the pain with the jack inhibitor, and we saw immediately that pain goes faster down than the swollen joint count, um, uh, and the tender joint count means there must be something else. And I'm, I'm really surprised what is ongoing with the, in the field of psychiatry. So where they treat um, um, schizophrenia and, and paranoid uh, schizophrenia with high dose steroids and other products, and they can, in some cases, make a huge change. And of course, knowing that all these, let's say, psychiatric disorders are tightly linked to rheumatoid conditions and chronic inflammation, uh, maybe this is of importance, but anyway, it will be challenging to separate it um, between what is reactive to response to the underlying disease or what is the direct effect. Um, but um, I learn it here, at least here in the university hospitals, the psychiatrics are really uh, very interested in the rheumatologists yes. uh, and, and trying to understand it and, and uh, trying to figure out what is a separate manifest disease and how it can be influenced it, uh, specifically with IL-17 vision. Yeah. Very good comments. Thank you so much, Frank. And thank you for joining us for this PSA podcast brought to you by the CSF. We really hope you enjoyed it and found it useful. If you did, don't forget to subscribe to our channels on YouTube, SoundCloud, or wherever you get your podcasts from so that you don't miss any future episodes. If you want to read more about what we've discussed today, head over to cytokinesignaling.com where you'll find detailed summary slides of each of the papers. See you next time. Thank you, see you.